Hi, Impact Festival. It's Mark here. I'm very excited to see this panel, Our Future with AI. And thanks for asking me to do a short opening word for it. AI really is the technological innovation that I'm most excited about at the moment. It obviously is having a huge moment right now. There have been awesome breakthroughs in the last year on this, and I just think that this is going to transform all of the different products that we have and everything across the industry. I know Elon has signed this open letter earlier this year calling for a six-month pause, but we all know Elon is a rat. He didn't wait long to ignore his own call and announce his new company, XAI, that he wants to go beyond existing AI and compete with OpenAI, Google, and Microsoft. Well, let's listen to the panelists of today. Heinz Dekhed Abdulaziz, Vladan Yoler, Sebastian Schmeig, and Anjili Zuparis, and see how excited they are about AI. Your moderator, Aaron Merck, will further introduce the panel. Enjoy. <laughs> All right. I'm so glad for this introduction. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Errol Merck. I'm the moderator. I'm the host of this session. We're talking about artificial intelligence, and I, I think language is important in this matter. Um, intelligence. We all need a smart phone. We're talking about artificial intelligence. But let's talk about us, the users. There are only two professions that call their clients users, drug dealers, software developers. <laughs> let's talk about us. Smart users, how can we work with AI ethically? Unless you've, well, uh, lived in a cave for the last year or two, uh, you must have noticed that AI is everywhere. Big tech companies like uh, Meta are investing huge amounts in AI, and that changes the way we perceive online inf information. And that makes the question relevant, what means digital agency in this age of AI, not only today, but also later. And this creates new challenges and dilemmas around ethics, economics, copyright, aesthetics. How do we use AI ethically? Do we need to stop it? Do we need to regulate it? And we're going to find some answers to those questions with a real eclectic panel of artists and politicians. Um, and of course with you, the audience here present with us today and online via impact.nl. You can share your questions with me via the chat or via email, and I will share those questions later on with our panel. Um, well, I'd like to invite you, Sebastian Smeek, to come sit here with me. Uh, Sebastian investigates the algorithmic car car circulation of images, texts, and bodies. He creates playful interventions that penetrate the shiny surfaces of our network society and explores the reality that lie behind them. Smeek focuses on labor, algorithmic management, and AI, and he is a professor of interface design at the HTW in Dresden. Sebastian. And also with us today is Vladan Joller, an academic, researcher, and artist, and I would say interdisciplinarian, because he blends data investigation, counter cartography, investigative journalism, writing, data visualization, critical design, and numerous other disciplines. He explores uh, and visualizes different technical and social aspects of algorithmic transparency, uh, digital labor exploitation, invis invisible infrastructures, and many other contemporary phenomena in the intersection between technology and society. Thank you. Thank you. And with us today is Anjali Suparis, uh, a data scientist, PhD candidate, uh, artist, and science communicator. Uh, her academic researches uh, focus on developing smartphones and wearable-based biomarkers that can be used to monitor one's mental and physical well-being for clinical trials. Her artistic research and science communication focuses on educating the people about AI and algorithmic violence. 
And that means the violence that is justified or is created by an automated decision-making system. Anjali, people. Thank you. And I, I promise you an eclectic panel of not only artists, but also a politician. Hint Decker Abdul Aziz, a member of parliament for the Dutch uh, political party Democrat 66. She specializes in AI, privacy, and discriminating algorithms. algorithms. She's also vice chair for the Committee of Digital Affairs. Hint. Uh, and Sebastian, I would ask you to step on stage and show your uh, presentation. Um, during the uh, Impact Festival, you may have seen already your uh, Sebastian's prompt battle, and that allows us to experience fascinating and the sinister side of AI image generator. Thank Sebastian. you. Yeah, thank you for having me. The prompt battle is tonight, and I'm going to briefly talk about it in the end of these four minutes. But I wanted to start by, and actually I would only love to do this, uh, showing this piece from Peter Dittmer, or by, by Peter Dittmer, Die Arme. And I thought about the future of AI, and I thought, okay, let's go back to my past with AI. And that's the first moment I encountered something which I think wasn't called AI back then, but it's a piece where... I saw it at ZKM in Karlsruhe. It's this huge thing. It's even bigger uh, in some instances. And you sit there and you can talk to this huge thing. And it's sort of poetic, dadaistic. It's really hard to understand what it is. But if you spend enough time with it and you manage to make it angry, it will spill the glass of milk that you can see there. And I thought back to this, I was a first semester student, I spent one day at ZKM and I would go back and back and back to this installation. I was really like, yeah, fascinated by it. And I think, um, first off, this is like the joy I uh, try to bring to my work with AI, even though it's very critical oft often. But I also think this piece is sort of like a good description back from 1992 about AI now and in the future. Now, let me make a very big jump into the present. And what we are looking at here is the, yeah, what you are presented with when you open OpenAI's DALI, which is a text-to-image software. So you sit there, you type in, I want to have a photo of uh, a birthday party that is celebrated by bears, and it will generate this out of thin air or out of data it has scraped. But it's a new image. And I was wondering, and that's what I want to briefly talk about is, if you are sitting there presented with this text-to-image AI, what does it do to you or what does it do to us and what kind of people or user does it make us using it? And my very short idea here is text-to-image could be viewed as a MMORPG, so a huge online role-playing game. How does it work? Those of you who, like me, sit there, use these tools, we are exploring the so-called latent space, which is the space of all images that the AI produce. And we're trying to find cool images, images that nobody has found yet, images that are offensive, that are personal, and so on. And this is sort of the goal of uh, the, the game to win. And question now is, who plays this game and what sort of players are being generated by this game? And we can turn to um, the taxonomy of player types by Richard Bartle, which was his attempt at describing what sort of players emerge in online role-playing game or what sort of players should be, a game should be designed for. And if we look at it, we can find killers. They like to show others that they have lost. Achievers, they like to achieve some status. Explorers walking around the game, seeing what is there, and socializers who just enjoy talking to others in the game. Now, if we map this to text-to-image AI, we have killers. They use the style of some artists, making them obsolete. They say, okay, if you don't use AI, you are going to be obsolete. Then we have the achievers who manage to create hands with only five fingers. We have the explorers who find hidden creatures in the latent space, like here the Krongus, or there's also something called Lope. Or uh, bottom left corner, we have socializers who hang out on mid-journey, helping each other, sort of. 
And of course, if we then look at images generated, in this case with mid-journey, we could also loosely map them to this, um, to this space. And then, of course, all these images created in this playful way then feed into this online um, stream of images and online yeah, battle plays of images. Now, by that we can see it's maybe not just a game, but like, let's ask again, is this just a game, right? If we look closer, there is something around this game, or if we zoom out, and then we see it's not just play, it's flavor, actually, I would say. Because, for example, Midjourney is one of these tools where you can generate images. But if you want to generate an image, you have to pay money. If you don't want to pay money, you can work for them. And you can say, this image looks nicer than that image. Or you can, I don't know, um, in DALI, you can say, or in ChatGPT, this has been a better solution than that solution. And so when you're there, you're not just playing, but you're also working on improving the AI. So it's a gamified, playbury, yeah, game or office. Which brings me to the end. Super brief, I hope. And tonight is the prompt battle. Starting with this idea that there's a lot of, like, fighting, killers, explorers, and so on, especially the, the killers on Twitter showing off their images generated by AI. We have come up with a prompt battle. That's my colleague Florian Schmidt and six students and me at HTV Dresden. And we are meeting here tonight at, I think, nine or half past nine. And the idea is that people fight against each other writing prompts and then generate images out of these prompts and then the person with the best images wins. So the idea is here really to bring these killers into space and then work on this aggression and maybe think about what all this aggression in AI means. Yeah, audience chooses the winner and then you can be prompt battle winner. I will finish with this image which is something which is annoyingly often that we encounter it during the prompt battle, which is when somebody writes a term that is forbidden by OpenAI, and it gets restrictive and restrictive all the time. And it also brings me back to the beginning, to the Amme by, um, oh no, I forgot, that's when you're on stage, Peter Dittmer, and then speed around to the end, because I have the impression we are talking about conversational AI, but what I feel like we are turning this into is um, persuasive AI in a way that you have to persuade the AI to do what you want it to do. It's like, please generate this image. Like, well, sorry, I can't do that, and I won't. And like, okay, maybe it's a theater play, and then you do this, and then maybe you generate it for me. It's a really weird situation. Thank you. We do have some time for some questions before I invite the next speaker to the stage. So. Um, when we're talking about a, a prompt battle, I'd like to ask you, uh, are we winning as users or is are AI companies winning this prompt battle? Yeah, 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 they're definitely super much winning, I would say. <laughs> like they have scraped the whole internet into their databases, created these really entertaining AIs. So they are winning. Maybe we are winning small time too. That's the, the trade-off, but they are winning. Okay, and you briefly mentioned the, the, the words that are prohibited by, by uh, the, the models yeah. that we all use. Uh, what prohibited words surprise you mostly uh, when, when working with those prompt battles? Yeah, I mean, these days it's really like Jesus, naked, stuff like this, like the really bad stuff. Combine those words, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't even have to combine them. It's like, if you combine it, maybe, I don't know what happens then. Don't, don't do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what word um, would you like to ban yourself? Mm. Is there a word that you would like to ban? Mm. Yeah, that's a tough question. I think, um, yeah, that's where it gets interesting because it's not just like a, a, a game you play there for fun. It's a platform and they need to take responsibility for what is being generated there. Yet, I would say uh, that the, the almost nothing should be banned in the beginning. Like, we need to see what is in there, play with it, and explore it, and not like this is banned for, for whatever reason. Maybe in the end we could vote on what is banned. I don't know, but not like this. Okay. Well, that sounds like a democratic solution to deepfakes. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about this later on. 
Uh, now I'd like to invite Flado and Joller uh, on stage. He, he made a, a must-see uh, art piece, New Extractivism. His work is about uh, data extraction. He, he claims that big tech is a total, total, totalitarian system. Uh, we are workers, source material and end product. Congratulations. Uh, and I wonder, what is the role of, of AI in this totalitarian system? I don't know how to change this. Okay. <laughs> uh. Okay. Oh, that was easy. Embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> Good start, no? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, four minutes. Okay, so I, I should probably speak about, maybe put some kind of keywords, and, and uh, today I'm going to present myself as a detective or investigator, so I will start with, with this one. And uh, the first question, of, I was always excited by this idea of like investigating AI, and, and how we can do that, especially from the position of someone who is outside, not someone who is working in the company, but someone who is like poor user. And, and so, but basically when we started to do this investigation on an anatomy of an AI system, there was one moment in, in which I realized it's, in, it's, it's much broader, the problem. It's not just about how we can, you know, go deep and try to understand those like uh, processes of training, processes of, you know, like data crunching and, and, and data collection and, and all of this. But, but basically, if you, if you really want to understand this kind of extended anatomy of those devices, then you really need to go much further and basically start from the earth and start from uh, elements, start, start from, from basically production process, and then the story is completely different. So then you are investigating basically, you know, I started as an investigator of AI, but I found myself you know, hanging in some kind of illegal mining places in India or, or, or sitting in front of Foxconn factory. So it, it's not like, you know, it's not what you are expecting from someone who is investigating AI. But basically this is all part of the story. So we, we, if we just look into the data sets, if you just look in, into that, we are just basically speaking about one little segment of, of the whole problem. So if, if we want to go Further, there is like, uh, and if we speak about like what's going on now, and basically what's the difference between anatomy of an AI in 2018 and, and today, we are seeing that the, the big part of the game it's happening basically in supply chains. It's happening in a, in a, you know, you see a lot of different like it's a, it became some kind of a, 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 a war zone basically the supply chain, who owns which material, who, who is able to, to produce somewhere, factories are moving from one place to another. So if we are investigating AI, we also need to investigate uh, uh, all of this. And, and so, uh, just not to repeat myself, I will, I will show you now this, another map that I did with uh, Matteo Pasquinelli, and, it, and it's basically about this kind of uh, assembly line of AI. You know, so how this AI is, is basically being built, this time not from the, the position of, of, of this, uh, you know, mines and, and, and supply chains and, and all of this, but, but the process. And then what, what I realized and what we are also covering in the text, it's basically this kind of human element in all of this. And then when you start to think about like humans in the, in, in the process, you are seeing that there is not so much artificiality there. So basically, we, we are speaking about like people who are labeling, uh, people who are choosing like what is going to be included in the data set, then people who are labeling data set, then people who are choosing some kind of taxonomies, people who are choosing. So it's, it's a lot of people, no? So, and, and, and what is presented to us, it's this kind of artificiality. But basically behind this, it's, it's really this Amazon Turk image of like a human being hidden behind the machine and making uh, decisions. Uh, but what is also interesting here, and, and what I really love about this, this the work with Matteo, is basically this idea to think about AI as a, some kind of compression. And basically it, it is really, this in one side it, it is it, it's what Matteo like really insisted in a sense it's that like you know uh, 
AI and machine learning is some kind of optical device, like a telescope, that allowed us to look inside of the uh, data set. But it's also a projection device. So once we create something, once we compress something into models, then it's basically being projected to the world. And I, I'm also really afraid of this kind of projecting rules, because like, if we think about that, we are compressing data, we are compressing images, compressing materials into some model. Okay. So all the things that is wrong within those like images or, or data sets are going to be projected as a rules. And this is something that is super dangerous. And then we were like investigating uh, you know. Yeah, but maybe it's not important. Mm -hmm. It's some image, you know. <laughs> and, and basically, we, we are, I can speak about without it, no, it's okay. So basically, what we are doing, we are compressing different kinds of data into those like uh, models and then projecting to the world. And then I, uh, in the last three, four years, I was like part of uh, one group of uh, scientists and artists as well were like basically trying to find a way how we can investigate those processes, how we can investigate those data sets. And, it, and, and this is where the problem is it's, it, it's basically starting. First of all, most of those companies doesn't care about giving us any kind of access to those data sets. But then there is also this idea of ethical data sets. And basically what was interesting for me, even we, we, we get the data sets and, and those data sets are huge. That's like millions and millions, and now we are speaking even about billions and trillions parameters in, in these new, new models. How we are even communicate with that mass? For example, we, we try to build the tools in order to see inside of what, but to, to, to investigate something that, that have like one billion of something, it's like almost impossible. So every day it's harder and harder. Every day it's like a bigger and bigger problem to even look inside of those data sets. But that's like just one problem because like the another one, it's what even if, if we find a way how to look inside of them, what we are going to ask them, the data set. Like what are the questions that we are asking data set? What kind of data set we want? And then the question is also like, who is going to choose? Well, you know, there is this story about like ethical data set, okay? But who, who, what is ethical data set at all? Who is choosing like what is being represented there and in which way? It's again some kind of projection of human uh, idea of projection of like some kind of cultural power or whatever to be to do that. And then if, if we think, and what was like super interesting for me, it's this like we are going towards, because like we went this threshold of like trillions of, of parameters. So basically, idea is to have the data set of all. It's a completely Borkesian situation. Like chat GPT want to have like all the books ever written. And then the question is all the books ever written is ethical data set? So, and then if you think about it, all the books ever written are basically deep in historical data, uh, bias. Who had the power to, who had the power to write books? Who, who was publishing those books? Who had the money to print books? Who was choosing? So we, basically, even if we have all the written text in the world, it will be a reflection of the colonialism and colonial powers or, or, or nations or, or, or uh, uh, that, that had the power to archive those books. Yeah. So I, I think there is a lot of ethical questions that, that we can ask there. And, we, we, and it, it, the, the problem every day, we are losing this bat battle because they're going into direction more, 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 more. And more, 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 more they're doing, our capacity to investigate, it's like really less and less. And, and they're much faster, and we are like really slow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Hello. I think we will continue. And I need to thank you for your yeah. uh, talk. We need to move on. Is there data without bias? Yeah. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, yes. Angeli, yes. I would yeah. like to invite you. Um, it's really interesting that you can bring both perspective as an yeah. artist and as a PhD candidate in machine learning, engineering, not far from here at the Leiden University. Uh, and as an AI artist at the Artificial Nouveau Studios. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you.
Yes, this is I. Uh, great. So, yes, I am. I just submitted my PhD thesis, uh, so I feel pretty comfortable talking about my topic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, and uh, my PhD focuses on uh, behavioral profiling using uh, smartphone and wearable data. Um, so in practice, it also means that I analyze uh, your location data, your the number of times you uh, open up an app, uh, the number of people that you interact with via Bluetooth, and then I try to estimate how depressed you are. But <laughs> Yes, so that's one part of it. Uh, the other part is uh, I also look at uh, physiological phenomenon that can manifest through your smartphone interactions. So I could look through when you tap your finger on your phone, I not only can uh, estimate how bad your Parkinson's disease is that day, but I can also detect if you've taken your medication that day. So just imagine, yeah, uh, every day when you open up your phone, if you're typing or if you're unlocking your phone the old school way, uh, uh, I can already infer, uh, yeah, how severe your disease status is that day. And so I think for me, uh, my academic research uh, really brings out this question of, like, how well can AI really get to know you? And for my art, uh, actually, one of my art installations, together with FIFA, is Mosen and uh, Yu Zhang, uh, we have the voices installation, in which we uh, demonstrate how easy it is to clone your voice, but also how easy it is to use your voice to express someone else's uh, secret and personal experiences. Uh, but yeah, well, three years ago, sorry if this is a broken record, I also did a project with Mozilla with, uh, with uh, Tim Van Overman, and we created Future Week, which was a website, now out of date, where we tried to predict when the police would commit a crime in the future. And this was a really interesting project for me because the goal, uh, ultimately for me as a data scientist, well, now machine learning engineer, I wanted to understand, are there key patterns to how the police uh, go about uh, killing people in the US? And it, it was, yeah, we did find some interesting patterns. So apparently, if you are a Middle Eastern older lady, you have the least likely chance of being killed by the police. But uh, apparently, there's no age discrimination. So the police have killed, uh, in the US, anyone from at least three months old to 102, I believe, where they've killed people with uh, I don't know, guns, cars, uh, air conditioners. It's uh, absolutely horrific. But yes, so, ah, yeah. But through my art, I also explore uh, how well can uh, AI be used to uh, identify uh, patterns of other peoples, so individual people like uh, voices, but also uh, groups of people such as the police. So uh, talking about our future with AI, I'm really interested in exploring how far are we willing to go to give data to AI for them to get to know us. So some of us in the room might already start uh, you know, wearing smartwatches where we want to monitor our sleep, uh, our step count. Uh, you know, This seems pretty straightforward. But now there are also uh, new wearables such as the Rewind Pendant, which is essentially a microphone and a necklace. And it records all of your conversations. And then at the end, it basically indexes your conversations. So you can like just switch at the end of the day. Oh, uh, what was this person's name again? Or uh, you know what? What did I uh, forget at the grocery store? Blah blah. blah. And now uh, the Mozilla also released the report about uh, privacy policies in cars. Apparently, out of all the devices you have. Uh, cars have the worst privacy policies, and Kia especially has apparently in their privacy policy the right to know about your uh, you know, sex life, your uh, religious affiliations, uh, you know, your closest intimate relationships. And so, yeah, where do you want to draw the line with which device uh, collects data and what for what purposes? So uh, in the next three slides, I'm going to talk about like the good, the bad, and the ugly for the future of AI and data collection. The, and these are all my personal uh, viewpoints. So I still think, yeah, preventative care and early detection would be great for AI to basically uh, take care of us with very limited intervention. And we can actually have uh, personalized care, which would be great. But I don't know how to do this in a constructive manner, because now you could use your, stuff, uh, your camera on your smartphone to, to detect if you have strep throat. Uh, but you know, 
if I get strep throat, if Britney Spears gets strep throat, if uh, Cleopatra gets strep throat, you know, this one uh, technique could be applicable to all of us, which is great. You know, now we don't have to de delay our appointments with the doctor. But then, if I get depressed, if Britney Spears gets depressed, if Cleopatra gets depressed, I have no idea if like my smartphone information is going to be applicable uh, to all of us. And but if it can, that would be absolutely fantastic because now we can say, oh, I seem to be depressed because I'm getting too little sleep. Britney is getting depressed because she's getting too much sleep. Cleopatra, well, uh, I don't want to uh, judge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, thanks. Uh, yes, and also a paper that I published earlier this year, the, the most horrific part for me, at least, or the bad, uh, would be that I, d I did a review of all of the papers that were published in the last 10 years that use machine learning to analyze smartphone and wearable data to predict clinical outcomes. And while, uh, while the papers were valid, they were all studied on, you know, maybe 10, maximum 50 people, and there was very little external validation. So it was like, yes, we can predict uh, someone's bipolar disorder, manic episodes at 90% among these 15 people who, you know, we collected 10 years ago or something like that. So we have no idea uh, if these models can be used for people for now, people of different backgrounds, or even for across different seasons. Uh, yes. Oh, and another concern that I have is about uh, the loss of context in uh, machine learning-based healthcare. Because, for example, if I have an eating disorder, maybe that's detected on my phone and that could be raised concern. But then if we apply that same model to someone who's going uh, through Ramadan, uh, the loss of context might be applied and then we might falsely, uh, you know, attribute, uh, you know, features of, um, or symptoms of eating disorders to someone uh, who's, who's just fasting for religious reasons. And the last is the, the ugly, so surveillance capitalism. What happens when uh, commercial or bad acting entities uh, capitalize on potential uh, vulnerabilities? Uh, so one example is uh, just by how you uh, scroll online, uh, you can actually get a really good indication if someone is uh, having a manic episode, if they're bipolar. So if you tend to scroll really fast, or you go back and forth between pages, or you cross-reference stuff, then yeah, maybe uh, that person is manic. And if you're manic, you're impulsive. And if you're impulsive, you might buy a one-way ticket to Las Vegas. So that could be <laughs> quite problematic. And, you know, even though they're, uh, you know, uh, social media companies might say, we won't capitalize on this, we won't, you know, code into our models that we're going to detect manic episodes, you don't need to. As long as you just say fast clicking means more expensive as, that's all. And that could be automated. So how do we uh, potentially... How, how do we protect people from kind of automated uh, manu uh, manipulation and, uh, and discrimination? I just realized I don't have a concluding slide, so actually, that's it for me. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that's, that's a great question to end, end oh, with, I guess. Uh, and yes. it's, it's also a great bridge to our next guest, yeah. Hintz Degger Abdulaziz, uh, our politician of today, yeah. member of parliament for uh, the Democratic, uh, the Democrats 66, not a Democratic party, that's in the US of course, uh, and I would say that Democrat 66 is the most tech optimistic political party in the Dutch parliament, so I'm, I'm really curious how do we live our future with AI and how do we regulate it? Looking forward to your... Yeah, so thank you. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'll just give a, a small talk. Um, uh, you asked me to reflect on your presentation and tell something about how do we live with uh, AI as a regulative uh, power uh, in the parliament. Politicians are not engineers, are not technical uh, usually, uh, but some of us are, So, uh, such as myself. I'm an engineer and I'm uh, interested in, uh, in IT and AI uh, before I was a, politi a politician. The thing that uh, that is the Dutch government uses a lot of digitalization uh, a long time ago without really understanding what it's all about. We all know the 
child affair, uh, toeslagenaffaire for the, the Dutch speaking. Uh, it was a little bit uh, uh, predictive uh, how uh, using technology could go wrong. Um, so we tried to regulate it and European and in, uh, in the EU also we are uh, trying to have uh, a good law uh, about AI. But uh, it's called the AI Act, and it's uh, a little bit about ethics, but it's also about, uh, it is more, uh, more a market a regulative uh, act, but it will help us a little bit. The thing is, last year, November, uh, I was uh, talking to you when ChatGPT came alive and just came to us. It's like all politicians also, the people that do, are not interested in IT or AI or, or anyone, and also the uh, mainstream media uh, were uh, suddenly interested in AI. It's just like they thought, oh, oh, this is happening, uh, it is smart, and maybe it will replace us, and all the scenarios uh, came along. Um, generally, in politics, people are uh, against AI or uh, uh, not against AI, or they love it or they hate it. But it's, of course, uh, it has uh, different layers, and it will affect all our, our uh, lives in the future. The main question is of politics and government is, what kind of framework do we need to be able to use AI? Uh, so maybe, uh, of course, we're able to do everything with the, all the data we have. Uh, and you see, like, regulatory power, like uh, uh, justice and police, they try to collect data. data. They even try to do predictive policing, which is absolutely not allowed. And uh, the more... Uh, um, um, the more uh, people know, they, they know that AI is also biased. Uh, it could be biased. Data collection should not be, uh, should not be uh, unlimited. And maybe one should ask themselves, uh, are, are we able to do it? Yes. But uh, should we uh, actually do it? Do we want to do it? Is it ethical to do it? So in my work, I tried to have uh, an ethical framework uh, before using algorithms at the, as, uh, in the government. Um, so I, uh, I asked our government to do that as well. And they promised me they will. Uh, there was a majority uh, about a human rights uh, test before using algorithm. But I also, after one year and a half, I also noticed that a lot of people working in the government are not aware of the bias uh, that should that is going on. So uh, my uh, next uh, project is trying to eliminate the bias in all algorithms uh, uh, we are using. Um, also, generative AI, like ChatGPT, is of course something totally different. So uh, what we try to, to do is uh, I asked all of our, our ministers to uh, write a vision about what should we do with generative IE as a government uh, and also in Europe. So they are working on that as well. Uh, actually, yesterday or the day before that, they also uh, uh, had a press release that they are going to do something about it. But of course, this is should be worldwide something. And you see that a lot of politicians, also the UK AI summit uh, also happened this week. So uh, my uh, to, uh, to come to a conclusion, I think politics and the government are uh, trying to deal with AI. And I think you should regulate it, not only like a market something or a product, because AI will affect all of our aspects in our lives in the future. You should have an ethical framework when to use AI and be very aware of what data to collect and when to use it and what for. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hint. Uh, and I'd like to start this panel discussion. We're going to talk about 15 minutes together, and then we have about 15 minutes to answer your questions. And I'd like to start off with you, Hint, because I, I'm going to play devil's advocate for those big tech companies. And they say, well, all this legislation, that's, that's pretty nice, but we don't have any innovation because of all those laws. What? Well, of course they will say that. 
<laughs> but uh, I think innovation, um, uh, I think uh, that's uh, having a, a clear framework, when to use something, if we look at AI as a product, when to use it, where to use it, for what to use it, if you are uh, clear about that as a government and as EU or international, then it's easier to innovate within the framework. It's like when you said, what data to collect, do we really want our clicking and our um, uh, uh, scrolling monitored and sent by the, to the government, for example? Uh, no, we, we shouldn't, and the makers of it or the, the companies that make it actually uh, could use some, uh, some clear frameworking here. Yeah, a framework. Yeah. Is there anyone that would like to respond on a... Oh yeah, well I have a follow-up question. So for these uh, frameworks, if that's okay, uh, is it mainly designed and aimed for big tech companies and not for, let's say, individuals who are also de designing AI systems? Uh, well, at this moment, uh, if, I, if we look, the, the only framework I know at this moment, uh, it's the AI Act, uh, which is a European framework. And then, like last, last week, there's a directive from the US president also. That's a different one. <laughs> um, it should be applied to all. But if we compare to another framework, which is the Framework for Digital Services Act, that only applied for the big ones and, and not for the uh, small ones. Mm -hmm. So the AI Act is uh, will be uh, apl applicable for all, but it will take about a year before it's really happening. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, Sebastian, you're, you're uh, working with AI. How do you experience the... the well, the not so positive sides of AI, uh, working with those prompt battles, uh, and what what well aspects are you worried about most? <laughs> what am I worried about most? Hmm. Yeah, this is, a, this is a super tough question. I think it's it's a bit also very broad when we speak about AI. It's like so many different things. What can I be worried about and what is like the good or the bad? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> one thing to, to start with a very small thing. What I tried to say in the end, and I really rushed it, was that you know computers can do anything and they can simulate anything. They're crazy wonder machines. But... I feel like we're in the process, like this AI is exciting, like conversation interface, but we are in the process of creating something that sort of refuses doing anything. It's like really like what I said in the end, like, okay, can you please do this for me? And says, no, I can't, I won't do it. And then you need to invent a story to make it do something. And I think we're turning a machine that we can program to do really interesting things. We might turn it into something that is totally out of our control, adhering to some company or to some law or whatever that really gets in our way of doing something interesting with it. Mm. And how, how would a framework, as suggested, how would that interfere in this, this well, dystopia? Well, I think it's, it's important that there is some way that we have open systems that we can work with and do stuff with that is not like limited by let's say open ai because they need to limit it to make more money because otherwise it might offend customer x or y i think that is important for us yeah uh Fladon, you talked about is there any data without bias a really interesting subject i guess um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i'm 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 not sure should, should we go in this direction, but okay. I, I, I think like what I basically try to, to kind of map there, it's, it's that there is a many, many, many different types of bias. So there are, some of them are like really hard to get rid of, you know, historical bias or, or technical bias, algorithmic bias. So most of the people are like concentrated on bias within the data sets because this is something, it's a picture, you know, or like it's a text so we can like play with it. It's more understandable. But what I really kind of enjoy doing, thinking about it, is this kind of like bias, algorithmic bias, or, or bias during the training process, not related to the data set, but the statistical bias itself. And that one, it's kind of like really hardcore. And, and in a way, I'm not so sure that, that this kind of getting rid of bias, it's a, it, 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 it going anywhere. Uh, the, the thing is like... If, if you mean if, it's actually impossible to get rid of bias? But how? Who? 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 Like who? Who is going to decide what is bias? Like, there is always like in, in, in on philosophical level, it doesn't exist without you, 
No? It makes sense. It doesn't exist without human being or others. Okay. So who is like defining like what? Are we going to have like some kind of UN gathering of all the people in the world who say this is a great data set? <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. But but that's not important at all. Okay, this is okay. It is. What is like uh, super important is like statistics as a re religion, and like so if you think about Gaussian distribution, it's like one kind of like. It's used for many different things, like dimen uh, dimensionality reduction. And that's, that's a in nice the process to An Anjali. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, is that? Or, or, would wait, you respond to this? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, just other jokes. Just, 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 just a second to, oh, to yeah, no, no, It's like a statistical yeah. thing. So, yeah. so basically, what we are doing those those machines are, are they're running on 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 many different combined statistical functions. And if we, we think like what those statistical functions are, they are kind of populist totalitarian <laughs> functions. They go towards the maximum or minimum. They, were, they are going towards the middle. They are not going towards, and you have like words like anomality reduction or, or whatever. So who is anomality? So I, I really like to think on the level of statistics what that means. What, what it means, uh, I am anomaly. You know, I, I'm an anomaly that is going to be reduced by this statistical function. So on the level of statistic, if we think about those machines as a as a as a statistical tools, machines, you know, that are doing statistics, then we should also question statistical processes, not just the data sets. And then there is another important thing. It's like who. Of course, but this is going into some kind of like, I don't know, Marxist theory or like who owns the <laughs> the, the tools of production and stuff like this. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, it does, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, uh, no, I think it was a very interesting direction. And I would argue maybe there is one data set where everyone kind of agrees that's perfect. And if you're a baby scientist, maybe you came across the IRIS data set. It's basically like if you're trying out a new machine learning algorithm, it's the way to go. And it's like, you know, 100 different flowers with different characteristics. And then you like predict based on number of petals, how long the stem is, like which flower it is. And you know, it, it's not discriminating against anyone. There are no outliers in missing did, data. Uh, oh yeah, but I just wanted we, to add. Because we still didn't develop this kind of sensitivity toward the other forms of living. So we are ah, just yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 sensible yeah. towards, <laughs> yeah, like maybe yeah. those, those like flowers are being offended. Ah, yeah. that they are classified as something. <laughs> That's true. No flowers were harmed in the process of making this well, data I, I believe. But did uh, you ask them? Ah yeah, but one question that I I do want to raise this that for this IRIS data set, like it was developed by Eugenesis, so now there's a community in the data science community like, oh, should we be popularizing this guy's work because he yeah, did try yeah. to use the data set to yeah, like, yeah. you know, uh, progress his eugenics example. So like, are, are we also going to include not the bias that the d developer has put into the data set, but, but yeah, but their theoretical views. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Could I respond a little bit about the bias question? Because it's very funny to me, everyone here knows what bias is, and there is also a chance of bias always. Uh, but I had uh, uh, in many debates with uh, different ministers in our government, I had to explain what bias is in like one minute. And uh, they sometimes they understood because uh, our government tried to um, be more efficient. And in my discussion with uh, a lot of uh, government workers, but also politicians, like, is it better to have like risk profiling? So, what are uh, we, uh, they profile people um, in uh, about in data? Like, where do you live? Uh, how old you are, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They don't uh, get your nationality or your color in the in the data set. So they say, yo, it's not discriminating, but they do try to profile the risk of fraud. Um, so it's like predicting the chance that it's also statistics. So I think that's a very dangerous way to uh, have more, you know, a, a fraud detection, and it's very, it, it's better to have random, uh, random control of people because then you have a clean data set and it's really random. But a lot of uh, workers, they say also to me, and also directors and politicians, they say, 
well, uh, data is very objective, and people are not objective. So it's very funny to me that <laughs> you 100% understand what I mean. But in my field of work, I have to explain myself like 100 times. Uh, and well, listening is very far away. So yeah. That's uh, that, that's interesting. It's one of the most popular myths or myths or misconceptions that AI is neutral or yeah. AI is new. That's also a myth that you shared, of course. <laughs> Are there other stories that we see in the media that, that one of you would like to share that you think like, come on, how could you talk about? Well, AI is an existential risk. Maybe it might be one of those myths. Uh -huh. I don't know. I don't want to be included yeah. as a speaker in this panel, but what kind of yeah, misconceptions? Do we, do we perceive, do we see in a public debate about AI? So myth busting. Oh, okay. oh no, no, no. Let the first. data scientist myth bust this. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. there, there's just one term that I actually, I have a love-hate relationship, and perhaps you'll see this with like uh, generative AI, which is uh, the term of machine hallucinations, uh, because I, for me it's quite clear that the machine is making a mistake. I mean, if we were to, you know, bullshit an answer or make a factually incorrect statement will be like, oh, this person is wrong or uh, they're like clearly don't know what they're talking about. But we're never like, oh, yes, they're definitely hallucinating at this moment. That would raise <laughs> concerns. So yeah, that's one. Hallucinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah one that's, point. That's a nice word to never use again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I have been asked uh, this uh, a lot of times because um, at the beginning of this year, this was the letter that uh, Elon Musk and a lot of scientists have uh, signed about existential problems with AI. And I, just what I said, AI exists for a long time. And when AI won uh, chess and go, uh, we all, as engineers, we knew, well, okay, this is the moment that is smart, but yeah, you never heard of it uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Asia to our eight o'clock journal um, but I don't th yeah maybe maybe it could go wrong or not but I don't think I think AI has been with us for a long time it will change democracies a little bit I'm afraid of that even more than that it, it will replace us that uh, that's more my my worry than replacement uh, anyone else worried about AI ex existential risk at the other side of the table <laughs> No, and I think that is sort of a smoke screen. I think like, what is the existential risk there? Like some really weird, rich people having too much money and too much power and then something <laughs> going wrong. So I think that is the, the point there. I think maybe a brief remark, like what, like, uh, what problematic term, I think artificial intelligence itself is such a huge word or two words <laughs> that mean nothing and everything it's like really probably like we need to be precise when we talk about something what do we mean and maybe not use the word word artificial intelligence for it yeah, yeah that, that's uh, this classical story how basically it's named like this because it was not so attractive or sexy to call something statistical compression <laughs> <laughs> But but what I'm like but I'm super like excited and, and like amazed by how like like probably two years ago like most of the conferences or like one year ago was about like uh, this kind of like fake news disinformation and and then we were like pushing all of those companies that they need to regulate this and suddenly like one year after we have all the same companies that we were like expecting from them to fight these kind of things. Now they have like some kind of hyper automatization of production of <laughs> fake news. So they made like a tools <laughs> for for mass creation of like uh, fake news um, or, or anything. So that, that's kind of interesting. And then uh, also like super interesting to think that then then we will also also ask them to to make tools that will recognize their own tools. So we will have some kind of one AI speaking with another AI and saying, no, you are the AI and you are AI. Mm -hmm. yeah, but but, uh, so, but, but the, the, the conclusion there, it's like, they are just going to be like even more powerful, but like some kind of hyperbolic powerful, because now they own factory, they own the means of production, they own the land that we are, uh, yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that is mostly neglected, the story in, in media right now. Mm. Are there other stories that are neglected or should get more attention, you think, when it comes to... Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, can I just add, like, a really tiny clip? Uh, 
I don't know the full de details for this story, but obviously to run AI or to have data centers, you need to consume a lot of energy, and I think that there should be more attention about the yeah, yeah. environmental impact of AI. And I wanted to give one story. I can't remember if this was in Ecuador or Honduras, but Google had signed like a contract to have water to uh, cool down their mm -hmm. data centers. And then I think that earlier this year, they had a drought. So then the, the local government had to decide how to if they were going to allocate water to Google to honor their contracts, or else there would be financial repercussions, or if they should give it to their local residents who were dependent on this. I don't know what happened to the story, so I have to leave you on the cliffhanger. Okay, let, yeah. Let's Google that. Yeah, 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 exactly. I have one, one story that is not so often in the news. What is mm -hmm. with the military? Maybe from the political point, are all, are all of those like ethical AI uh, stories are including military, or? Uh, uh, I don't know yeah, if you can keep it brief. We only have one minute left, uh, left for this panel, so. I just, am. Is it because but usually what is like really funny is like that military it's not part of the story. Like how, what is the 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 the, the use of AI in in, in like uh, war machines and like who is going to regulate that? Is there anyone stopping that? And the fact that all of those technologies are even coming from military. Yeah. So yeah. It's interesting that we are like kind of a, like, oh, is it like fake A very small or? answer to this one. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my party of my fraction asked the government to not have uh, machine learning decide who to kill. Uh, and then the Ministry of Defense have uh, also um, uh, write a report about how will they will use AI in the future. Oh, so nice. they are really thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'll just quickly add that uh, in the Netherlands, the occasionally, I don't know how often they do it, but the military has like a responsible AI conference where they demonstrate their AI applications. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's always out of, by the time the public knows it's out of date, yeah. probably way more advanced. Okay, yeah. yeah. Sebastian, anything you'd like to add? A story that was neglected by the media on AI? No? Then we're going to you, the audience. Any questions online? You can share them. I got a fancy iPad. So you can ask them via the chat or via email or here in the audience. We've got a question box. I pass it on. Okay. What is that box? That's a microphone. It's not working yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, I can make. Zeg eens iets. Okay. Uh, you can share your question and then I'll just sh yeah. share it with everyone. But maybe take the one of the oh, microphones. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for, uh, for the panelists. I have a question for, I guess, different members of the panel at the same time. Um, and it's about uh, the reappropriation of the means of production, uh, just to, you know, <laughs> pick up on that subject. Uh, I was wondering about uh, free and open uh, source software, um, reappropriating the models, um, running them locally, not having the data flowing back to the companies. Is it something politicians are talking about as it being discussed? Uh, is it something that makes sense technically? Um, and what are the possible political ramifications uh, of this movement? I'm, I'm not completely, you know, I don't have a lot of illusions about the fact that there's also politics in there, but I was curious to hear your reactions about it. Yeah, th yeah, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, politicians are talking about this. Actually, we are trying to reduce the power of the big tech, uh, which is very difficult to do as a Dutch politician. Uh, these things should happen uh, uh, on European or international scale. Um, uh, there are several things happening, uh, like for a different kind of use. I tried, I asked the government, and I even implemented in one law to all only to use open source first or try to use open source first and then to go to use uh, something else. We also uh, agreed to invest in a European cloud. You can try to create a Dutch cloud and a Dutch Microsoft solution, but it doesn't work. You have to go international. 
or you have to invest in European cloud. So the power of big tech is uh, is questioned uh, politically in, in Holland. Uh, we also have talked about something that is called public spaces, which is like publicly funded internet or social media, uh, which is not going, it's not uh, very popular yet, but it's uh, happening and it's funded also by the Ministry of Education. So yeah, it's especially, it's, it's, uh, speci it's the talk of the, of the day, yeah. <laughs> If I may add something to, or also respond to the question, just to give um, one example for this open source uh, stuff happening in generative AI, and that it's not really per se the solution. So there is different generative AIs. One of them is Stable Diffusion, which is sort of open source, and it's based on this so-called Lion data set that is, I think, basically only data set that is open, that is large enough to make this, well, good enough AI. But even though it's open source, it's hyper aggressive. Like it follows the same rules of scraping the internet, not asking anybody. And it's really like if you look at it, the way it's run, people are complaining. It goes to the server, totally ignores that people are saying, don't scrape me. And it scrapes it so aggressively that the servers are going to their knees because it's really like going super fast. So I think just making it open source might not be the, the only solution here, but maybe think about if scraping the internet without any like care for whoever you scrape, that might, might be the problem here. Yeah, and I, I think also the, the, the situation is like how, like we managed, if you think like 10, 20 years back, so we managed somehow to, to screw that up completely, like with the internet, you know, so we had like, and, and on, on the level of the protocol, it's fantastic, it's so like democratizing, like everyone, it's a sender, receiver, it's beautiful, no? But we somehow managed to to kill it, no? And and uh, the, the thing is like, uh, but it was still much more democratized in the sense like your need to participate in the internet game is to have one computer that's, that is connected to something, you know, that you can afford, that almost everyone was able to afford. The price now for participating, it's much, much higher. So that means like if we are comparing those two revolutions, this one, it's really closed circle you know, that can participate. So the level is like uh, much higher than, than, than. So in that sense, and then what is also like really provocative way to think about it, it's like how the, 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 this kind of things that we believed in as a open, open source, as, a, as, a, as a those platforms when we are exchanging the, the knowledge about how we are doing coding, the, the creative commons images, they are now all scraped for uh, uh, be, as, a, as, a, as a resource for, for, for an AI. So basically we kind of also screw up there because we were not ready for, for the, the open source and, and creative commons and other licenses participating in this thing that is happening. Turned out to be source material after all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Free one. Is there another question from the audience? Yes. Hello. Um, I have a question, I think particular to Hint, because, um, yeah, I think in the, we, we had another, um, another talk earlier today already, and we were also talking about the child uh, affair. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I'm basically just wondering why is it so important to use algorithms in the specific context of making decisions that have social repercussions? What, I mean, we, we talked about it in the other talk that it's quite an efficient tool to use it in production and to use it in contexts where maybe there is some kind of efficiency level that needs to be achieved and or to make certain processes better or whatever way, but not nobody is necessarily harmed on a individual level by that. No social destinies are being decided by that. So why is it so important to use AI in that specific context when it's about governing? Um, are we losing a battle or is it that important in that context? Okay. 
Well, um, if it was up to me, it isn't. It is not important to use algorithms uh, to, to detect fraud. And a couple of weeks ago, there is a huge inquiry about fraud policies in the Netherlands for the last 30 years. And I listened to a couple of hearings about it with uh, past ministers of uh, social, uh, social affairs and some of the employees. And they actually, and I, 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 I always blame uh, math education in the Netherlands uh, of this. They really didn't understand this uh, very well. Uh, like a couple of years ago, they really thought only of, uh, it's more efficient. It's more efficient to use algorithms. So when I ask a minister, well, please do uh, like random selecting of uh, uh, of uh, fraud detection. They say, yeah, but but we find more fraud if we use algorithm. But one should ask themselves if if finding fraud should be a goal of the government. If we, if you ask me, it shouldn't, because uh, human rights should be a goal of the government, and finding fraud should be like you know second. It's just it's just a, a nice check, and if we get some money out of it, it's okay. But a couple in 2015, they set a goal of money uh, coming from uh, fraud detection, and that's why they uh, they started to work like this, and it's very hard for them to switch back to the olden days when you just are checked only randomly once in, a, in six months. So that's. Any other questions from the audience? If the hands over there, yeah. Hi, thank you everyone for uh, this great panel. I noticed a bit of what I would call kind of a philosophical contradiction in between what Hind you're arguing and what Vladan you're arguing in terms of this question of what an ethical data set could be. I think on the one hand, politicians feel like we can kind of uphold certain ethical uh, standards, but as we're seeing in our current climate, that's absolutely not true. Politicians are not always operating with ethical principles in mind. And at the same time, we can't expect that uh, private platforms will also be able to self-regulate ethically. So I'm wondering um, to all of you, uh, if you've encountered some sort of like intermediary body that perhaps gestures towards uh, a kind of ethical regulatory way of approaching data collection. Um, if you have any examples that might gesture towards an ethical approach here. An example of ethical uh, data collection. Um, uh, who, uh, I've, yes. I've, uh, uh, can't blame me for looking at you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll give it a try. Uh, Maybe this is a little bit twist, a uh, bit of a twist, but I think, uh, let's say, individual data collection or like community data collection might be an honorable task. So, for example, uh, in Beijing, the uh, air quality pollution is out of control. And uh, well, when I was living in China, well, my neighbors thought like, oh, the the Beijing like ecological group was not being honest about the numbers. So then. Uh, you know, everyone in the neighborhood started buying like CO2 detection devices and ca uh, calculating like, oh, what are the, the, how bad is the air pollution today? And it was much higher than what the, the municipality was saying. And I think that's a good approach because everyone has the goal of like using data to improve their uh, environment without any commercial or uh, antagonistic objectives behind it. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Another response from you guys? Uh, There's two things I can think of. One <clears throat> might be an odd one, but Wikipedia, maybe? Mm -hmm. Sitting down together and agreeing on something, and that is the data you collected, and that's then the information. And the other one, like from a <clears throat> business point of view, I think the company is called Anthropic, and they are working on this constitutional AI where they write down rules for their AI and then see how it reacts to the rules or what it does. And at the same time, they're running like this experiment where they have people coming together, writing a constitution, so to speak, for the AI, and then and they see what comes out of that and try to compare it and see where these things could go. Yeah. I think like the, uh, a gentleman here in the front who also raised his hand. So my question is, um, so the subject for this one is uh, our future with uh, 
IA and I ask actually for you and me as Dutch people what will be uh, the biggest impact of uh, of the development of IA in 10 years for us in daily life Ooh. Oh, yeah. because it's uh, something which we all encounter of course directly uh, this is the best last question I can dream of <laughs> <you>. <laughs> yeah that's brilliant. Yeah. It's probably an ordered question. I'm, I'm like, it was so, it's so good that I'm like questioning, is it like real? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Right. Uh, I will try to take the most optimistic approach. Uh, I'm really into the federated learning movement, which is still being able to benefit from uh, AI, but on a local basis. So, for example, let's say, you know, Netflix uses AI for their recommendation systems, but instead of you sending your data to Netflix's servers and they learn so much about you, you can do it the other way around. So you download Netflix's, uh, like, uh, recommendation AI, and then it learns just locally, like, oh, this is, you like Nick Cage and, uh, I don't know, uh, Naomi Campbell, and these are the films that you should watch. And that way, there's not an incentive to collect masses amount of data by you, but also you reduce your ecological footprint as well. Locally. Yeah, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I'm not approaching this from a scientific point of view because I'm not a scientist for a long time now. Uh, I think, um, in, my, uh, in my view, the most we as Dutch people uh, can see from AI like two things. The positive one is you always have an assistant, which is ChatGPT, something like this. Uh, that's create. We are all in creative industries, so you can create something for you, or you can discuss things with if it's go and get, get better. And the other one is uh, all the recommendations on social media. As Dutch uh, people, we are uh, very much on social media, uh, much more than our, our European uh, friends. Um, so all uh, the filter bubbles are uh, going to be even more. And uh, I am afraid of some uh, even more uh, like we are less a society and more like uh, small groups living uh, next to each other. So that's more. Yeah. Polarization. Polarization. Yeah. Flannel. No, you, you, you're not going to mm. <laughs> make any predictions? No. That's all right. Okay. I, okay. Mm. Well, we are neighbors. You're from Germany, I guess. So, Sebastian, it, it, it makes sense, right? <laughs> to reflect a little bit on your... <laughs> Shall I say something? <laughs> <laughs> Well, very unspecific. I mean, for um, it always goes into this like positive, negative, and so on. I don't know, but um, I mean, from my point of view as an artist, I really hope for like some interesting developments, like in terms of aesthetic and new movie and film, and I don't know, like just like these things. I hope there is something that's going to happen, and I'm sort of um, positive that will happen. On the other hand, I mean, we see we don't have to look ten years into the future. It's clear there's going to be so much fraud because, like. Mark Zuckerberg, sort of impressive, but you know, like, th this can be super <laughs> precise and you are, like, you, you have to believe it because it looks so real. And the other thing is, to me, what looks very um, uh, frightening is, like, cost-cutting. Because you can automate so much, like, why do you need teachers? You have ChatGPT and so on and so on. Like, this is such an easy argument to make to, s to save costs. And this, I think, will have a big impact. Interesting. Yeah. It just, oh, yeah. I don't need this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it might be w nice to mention that uh, actually you m actually made this Mark Zuckerberg video, uh, didn't you? Yeah. Was I. Yeah. 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 Was okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's that's really uh, well the last thing that I'd like to share with you guys today. Uh, give a big applause to Vladon, Hint, Sebastian, and actually. Yeah, thank you. And to you as well. Thank you. Yeah. And oh, and for you. Well. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Thanks. Thanks.